Tonight on Q2, a long time coming. This is what it looked like before. Once again, you can see the river was coming all the way to the right. The northeast entrance to Yellowstone will finally reopen to visitors Saturday. We get a sneak peek of the repairs as local business owners patiently await the big day. <laughs> Plus, an incredible delivery. I've just been calling him lucky number seven. He's my lucky number seven. All the stars align as a mom gives birth by herself to the first indigenous baby born in Billings on Indigenous Peoples Day. Also, stories of survival. My son would not sleep in his bedroom. He would sleep on the couch because it was close to my bedroom. A son puts his life on hold as he rallies for his mom every step of the way in her fight against breast cancer. The MTN News starts right now. From Montana's news leader, this is the MTN 530 News. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday. I'm Russ Riesinger. Our top story tonight. You don't have to travel to Yellowstone to see wildlife. Five days after he first showed up in Billings, a bull moose is still roaming the West End, and there have been several close encounters with the animal. Check out this video, captured Monday on the Adult Resource Alliance's security cameras near 15th and Grand Avenue. You can see that moose go running by this man as he's sitting on a bench outside the nonprofit, coming within just a few feet of him. We received reports this morning that the moose was spotted near Polly Drive. Fish, wildlife, and parks are hoping he decides to leave town on his own sooner rather than later. We'll have more on this particular sighting tonight at 10. If you don't believe in fate, maybe this next story will sway you. A lame deer woman is the mom of a healthy new baby boy after a sequence of events you have to hear to believe. Our Casey Conlon reports. One of these double tree shuttle buses gave maybe its most important ride of the year earlier this week when a woman staying at the hotel and attending an indigenous breastfeeding clinic went into labor. I woke up and I was like, oh no. And I went to the bathroom and then I was like, is my water breaking? It was news Misty Pipe really didn't want, at least not this week, during Montana's first ever indigenous breastfeeding counselor training course. I came up and I was like, okay, I have no early signs of labor. This is good. But you had a feeling. Yeah, I had that full moon. The moon was full early Monday morning, and sure enough, Pipe, 38 weeks pregnant, went into labor around 2.15 a.m. Her husband was back in Lame Deer taking care of their other six children, so she was all by herself. So I called the front desk. Do you guys just give rides to the airport? And then the guy's like, like where do you want to go at like 2.30 in the morning? besides the airport and I was like, well, I was just wondering if I could catch a ride to the clinic. I was like, I think I'm in labor and he's like, oh my God, yes, for sure, come down right now. Oh, catching a ride. The driver took Pipe to Billings Clinic to meet her trusted midwife, Chantel Blackwell. What happened next was an experience Pipe will never forget. She was like, you, you, you know your body, so you could do this. So when he started coming out, I reached down and I grabbed him out and then I was like, I don't have no one to cut the cord. And she's like, you're going to cut your own cord. And I was like, oh my God, I've never cut my own cord. As if this story wasn't good enough, Hawk Shile Jr. was the first indigenous baby born on Indigenous Peoples Day at the clinic this year. It also happened to be Pipe and her husband's 12th anniversary. But all she could think about was getting back to the training course. I was like, well, if you guys discharge me, I could still make it. And then she's like, you need to quit it with that conference. She's like, you're not going to make that conference. She stayed at the hospital Monday, but both she and Hok Shile were back Tuesday for the 45-hour week-long clinic, crucial to rural reservations. It's a system that has really neglected a lot of our indigenous families for decades, and the result of that is extremely low breastfeeding rates. I successfully breastfed um, my six other children. When a woman calls me at like 3 in the morning and is like, I'm just going to give them a bottle, I'm just going to do formula feeding, and I'm just like, no, you got this, you know, you're going to coach them through it and stuff. And, and so it's really important to kind of um, call that back and bring it back into our community. It's not the only important thing she'll be bringing back. In Billings, Casey Conlon, MTN News. These road close signs at the northeast entrance of Yellowstone National Park are about to be a thing of the past. On Saturday, these roads will reopen to public vehicle traffic for the first time in four months. But Thursday morning, I get a look ahead. I'm about to hop in the car with Superintendent Cam Shawley for a look at the roads that went from wrecked to repaired. 
looking up, the beauty of Yellowstone in the fall is on full display. But what park officials are eager to show off Thursday is what you see by looking down. I think if you ask me uh, June 13th, if you ask me at that point, would we be standing here today, four months later, having the conversation that we're having and seeing the repairs done that we're seeing, I would have said that was probably not feasible. Four months later to the day, construction crews are finishing up repairs that will once again allow vehicles to drive through the park from Cook City to Mammoth, West Yellowstone and beyond. I've never seen this level of coordination and collaboration in such a short amount of time getting so much done. The repairs have come at no small cost. Sholly says the Park Service has spent about $50 million and has brought in about 300,000 tons of material to repair these roads. As this entrance to the park gets set to reopen, businesses in the gateway communities of Silvergate and Cook City are closing. I am actually about 20 minutes from leaving Silvergate for the season. Um, but. You know, it, it's it's next season. It's we're opening back up November 18th to you know accommodate cross country skiers, snowshoers, and people who want to go see the wolves in the park after such a long time of no one getting into Lamar Valley. The only park road left open for regular vehicle traffic this winter will be from Gardner to Mammoth, and that's the last section of major road repair the park has to complete. Sholly says that will open November 1st. But for now, park officials and locals alike are celebrating the opening of the northeast entrance, putting the devastating flood behind them. In Yellowstone, Jackie Coffin, MTN News. Well, tomorrow is a very special day here at Q2 as we celebrate our pink breakfast with breast cancer survivors and their loved ones. We'll be sharing some amazing stories of survival on Montana this morning, all morning long. And now Diane Parker brings us one of those incredible stories as a son rallies behind his mother, helping her win the biggest battle of her life. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and that has us telling some incredible survivor stories like Athena Gorder's story. She recently wrapped up treatment right here at Billings Clinic with her son as her support system. This course is run, and I'm on my way. Athena Gorder was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 47 in 2020. Her 20 year old son Payne stopped his entire life to be with her at every single doctor's appointment, chemo treatment and cancer milestone. Here we go. First shave. I don't know how he did this. I don't know. People say that um, you're so strong. Let me see it. And my <laughs> thoughts are I'm not strong, I do what I have to do. But the strength that we get is the strength from our family and the strength from our support system. From her hair journey, her first relay for life, to treatment and even matching tattoos, her son Payne was there through it all. My son would not sleep in his bedroom. He would sleep on the couch because it was close to my bedroom so that if I needed anything at any time, he could hear me. He did not want to leave my side. He turned 21 in the midst of this entire thing. And the most important thing to him was getting me through this. Today, she's 50, in remission, and has picked up a new skill to pass on to other survivors as a permanent cosmetic artist. When I went through chemotherapy, you lose every single hair on your body. You, you lose your eyelashes, you lose your eyebrows. I had my eyebrows microbladed, and when I had lost all my hair in, uh, in my eyebrows, I still had eyebrows on my face, and it made me feel feminine. Now she's microblading survivor eyebrows as a donation to women who face the same battle. And if that wasn't enough, she's got another big goal. I will be um, competing in the Mrs. Montana and Mrs. Montana America and Mrs. Montana American pageant this summer. And my platform will be breast cancer awareness and um, metastatic breast cancer research. She's got a big story to tell, and it all started with a big diagnosis, an even bigger support system, and now she gets to help others with her big heart. In Billings, Diane Parker, MTN News. For more information on Athena Gorder's cosmetic ink artistry service, free of charge for breast cancer survivors, 
Call Charisma Salon in Billings at 406-256-3300 or visit her on social media. The two contacts shown right there on your screen. We'll still ahead on the MTN 530 News on Q2. Thieves getting bolder by the day in Billings, it seems, often right in broad daylight. That story next. And in sports, it's the battle of the unbeatens as Central and Lewistown look to stay perfect on the gridiron. More on that big matchup coming up a little later in sports.